Hello. Uh, oh my gosh, I think, okay, my mouth seems slow and my face seems blurry again all of a sudden. Um, but why don't you folks uh, introduce yourselves and maybe I can uh, reload my page here. I'm going to reload it. Okay, so maybe we should, I don't know if, if our audience can see us without David right now, but just in case you can, welcome to our broadcast today where we're going to be focusing on good reasons um, not to get close to other people um, and also focusing on how to express uh, criticism with people that you care about in a successful way. David, you're back with us, right? Yes, here I am. Uh, yes, and the was, reload button really worked. Jill, worked. I, was, I was watching the Facebook page and indeed you were on. And so thank you okay. for that introduction of what we're going to be kind of focusing on today. Um, Great. Yeah. And um, I'll just say I'm Jill Levitt and I'm the uh, clinical psychologist and the director of training at the Feeling Good Institute. And Mike? I'm Mike Christensen. I'm a clinical counselor in Canada and uh, do some training and teaching with the Feeling Good Institute in our online um, Canada division. And um, just so thrilled to be here. We had a fun weekend last weekend watching David and Jill do a one day workshop that went off um, incredibly. And I'm so excited today about kind of digging more into that. How do we how do we connect with people when we're offering criticism, when we're not pleased necessarily with how they've done it and, and what gets in the way of that? And I'm David Burns. I'm the author of Feeling Good, the New Mood Therapy. I'm just grateful to be here working with both of you. And uh, I want to second what you said. I, working with you, Jill, last week in our full day workshop it was just an amazing experience. I just, I just thought you were spectacular. Of course, I always think that, but it's always true. And my well, you make uh, it easy. So <laughs> working alongside you is just a lot of fun. And then, Mike, thank you so much for the fabulous work you did with the online folks, because we had two-thirds of our audience was uh, online, one-third was in person, and uh, the people online got small group practice and made it a very personal experience. I was just very touched, touched and, and grateful to have that experience last week. Uh, okay, so let's start out on how to give a criticism, how to express angry feelings. In, a, in an effective way. And then we want to uh, answer a question uh, we got from Mark Noble, but we'll keep it anonymous so as not to identify anyone. But it was a very challenging question on pornography, which should be enough to excite everybody. <laughs> and then we're gonna go on to the main uh, course of the, of the day. Uh, one of, I think, is perhaps the most important and fantastically interesting and exciting topics in psychotherapy and perhaps all of life at this time is why is it so hard for people to develop loving intimate uh, relationships and I've been raising the question uh, on my feeling good podcasts and things for, for for a number of weeks or months here saying you know when therapists come to our group they can learn to use the five secrets of effective communication to to do far better empathy work with patients and start getting perfect empathy scores most of the time and learn to handle criticism and convert it into warmth and trust almost instantly in almost all cases, not 100%, but certainly 90% using the five secrets. But then they come to my Sunday hikes and they're in some kind of conflict with their mother or their ex or or some, their boyfriend, their, their girlfriend, their son, their, their daughter, their, their brother. And then all of a sudden, it's six months later, 12 months later, and they're still in conflict with that person. And they're still not using the five secrets of effective communication. And I've been scratching my head and saying, why is this? When most of the time when I'm treating someone with depression or anxiety, they can recover just in a, in a flash. And, you know, Jill and I, uh, when we work together, we usually see a complete elimination of symptoms in a single therapy session of about 90 minutes. But often people are so much slower. And then we suddenly got the answer this week, and it was something I've actually been preaching about and teaching about for for years. I've, I don't know I, how, how the answer, I could have forgotten the answer, but we have it for you. <laughs> so we know the cause of the world's problems because this is not just therapists, it's 
everyone has troubled relationships and the whole world is getting more hostile and hateful and polarized. So we'll, we'll give you the big answer here in a few minutes, but let's start out on, uh, we'll go on to giving criticism and then, uh, so you pornography. Think should, you think we should start with the giving criticism and, and pornography, and then we should do the the what we should that's go what I was the reasons not to. Okay, versus we can go in any order. Okay. But it's all good. Yeah. Um, well, what, what I, we're just thinking on our feet here, but what I'm thinking is maybe we need to deal with our audience's resistance before we teach them how to give criticism to other people. Sure. In other words, that's that's the art of intimacy as well. And maybe our audience will be more excited about giving criticism to others after we address good reasons not to do that. Yep. Now, Jen Wright, just a hello to some of the people. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. She says, anyone else having trouble viewing and listening? I was having trouble viewing myself and I hit the reload button on my computer uh, it's, it's the upper left hand area. It's a little circle with an arrow on it and that that helped. Sean Stiller, Dave speaking the truth. Well, that's good. I don't know what truth I spoke, but I'm always glad to be told I'm speaking the truth. Rob Wiley, RN, thank you. It's true that if you can't stop the blaming, right, absolutely. Samir Patali, thank you for taking up this topic. For, for me, the timing couldn't have been better. Thank you. Lisa, please share this broadcast now so others can watch it as well. Yeah, she's saying share it with your friends. We're trying to build up our audience. It seems on our best uh, broadcast, we can get about uh, 1.5 thousand views over a week or so, and, and it would really be neat to see those numbers climb. Mark Noble, hello, and we have an answer for your question. We won't reveal any uh, identifying information about anyone. It's a general topic of great importance to people these days. Kathy Thorpe, hi. Mike, I remember you from the Japanese Cultural Center, four-day intensive. And uh, yes, I, that was a great intensive. Uh, and Sean Stiller, hi, David, Jill, and Mike, and Phil McCormack, hello, and all these good TJ Lucian, Ra Raj Oswald, and so forth. So why don't you get us started, uh, Mike and, and Jill? Well, David, when um, we're, Jill was talking about, you know, the the reasons why we are reluctant to give or offer criticism or, or, or conflict, there's it really comes back to those two aspects of the resistance that you talk about: the outcome and the process resistance, right? And the outcome resistance is, in in essence. I don't want yeah, just to, get to clarify close to the what. So I, just let me stop you. For, I want to clarify what we're talking. Are we talking about how to give criticism, or why people don't want to use the five secrets of effective communication in general? Because we've got well, all of these wonderful <laughs> seventy-five reasons that therapists yeah, put up. Great, great. Let's go with the all yeah. the reasons. Yeah, not to give, not to, not to use the five secrets. Right, yeah. which encompasses giving criticism, receiving criticism. Right. Yeah. Right. So that. what Absolutely. are the five secrets of effective communication? And it's uh, EAR, empathy, assertiveness, and respect. And uh, this is in my book, Feeling Good Together. All the therapists uh, have access to this. It's a one-page handout. Hi, Ron Alberg, favorite Ron. Uh, he's calling oh, us Ron favorite. Ron is going to be a big help today, I think. That yes, is. he is. And so I've got your awesome. fabulous list here, yeah. Ron, of all the reasons not to use the five secrets. But we've got the disarming technique. We talked about that on our last broadcast, finding truth and what the other person is saying, even if the criticism seems unfair. And this is a magically powerful and effective uh, technique for transforming a hostile interaction into a loving trusting one, but it requires, you know, the death of the ego. And then there's thought and feeling empathy, repeating the other person's words of thought empathy, feeling empathy, acknowledging how they're feeling. And maybe they're hurt, feeling hurt or angry or anxious or, or, or whatever. Um, inquiry, which you do at the end, asking gentle questions to have the person tell you more about what they're unhappy with you about you know what what their criticisms of are are you uh, of you and then uh, i feel statements is sharing your own feelings in a vulnerable way so i'm feeling kind of anxious right now too and i'm feeling kind of hurt and and a little bit angry and and yet you know i see that your criticisms of me are true and and you have a right to be angry with me right now and let let, let let's let's talk about it i i really care about you you're you know i you're one of my best friends, and and that makes it especially painful uh, 
when we argue, but but this can deepen deepen our relationship. Tell tell me more what what's going on. That would be the general kind of thing. So you've got uh, disarming thought and feeling, empathy, inquiry, I feel statements, and stroking, and and uh, and then. One of the things I put my toolkit and in my book, Feeling Good Together, is this list when I'm teaching people these things. See, I've got 12 good reasons not to listen, not to empathize, not to use the disarming technique, 12 good reasons not to express your feelings, and 12 good reasons not to treat the other person with respect. Because once we start teaching people these these things, uh, they say, well, why, why should I have to, to listen to her? You know, what, what, what she's saying isn't true. You know, so one of the barriers to empathy is thinking that it's so important to be right and to impose your truth on, on, on someone. And, and one of the barriers to respect, treating the other person with, with respect is, well, why, why should I be nice to him or her? You know, he, he, he's been treating me like crap all these years. So that, that type of thing. And the quick answer to that, when patients ver verbalize any of these 36 forms of resistance, and when we're teaching five secrets, then I, I simply respond with a paradox, paradoxical inquiry, and say, well, you know, you don't have to treat her with respect. Uh, uh, absolutely don't you don't are, are you saying that you would prefer not to and then if the person says yes I'm not going to say well I'm glad you put that out there on the table sadly I don't know any way to develop a loving relationship w without conveying warmth and respect to, to the other person but let's see what our listeners think and, and could I read some of these or do you want to read some of these Jill or I was just gonna uh, actually maybe we could ask the audience a quick question David I'm stealing this yeah. from you I've seen you ask this at workshops but you know when you ask the audience to think like Think of one person that you're in yeah. conflict with right yes. now. Perfect. Right? So the audience, right? Anyone who's listening to us, think of one person that you're in conflict with right now. One person that you might not be getting along with. And then, David, I think this is the way you say it, but this is what I understand is I, now I want you to picture like if magically you could be incredibly close to that person, would you want that? Yeah, if you could just press a magic button and that person who you so deeply resent would be your greatest friend in the world with no effort on your part, you're going to press that magic button. And what we see in workshops and perhaps what we see today is 80% mm -hmm. of the people or 90% are not going to want to press that magic button. Right. And and then we ask, you know, already, you know, some of you are, are going to say, heck no, I don't want to be close to this person that I'm in conflict with. And then for those of you who say that you do, right, for the like 20% who are like, yeah, no, actually, I, I really do want to get closer to that person. I want to have a better, more loving relationship with them. Then we like to ask you, and now if you really thought in your heart of hearts, your deepest truth, who do you think is more responsible for the conflict? Who should have to do the changing? Yeah, who's in, more to blame? Who's the bigger? Yeah, who's more to blame? You or the other person? Always the other person. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like everyone's got to answer. You know, we should be send us your answers in your text box, whether you wanted a close and loving relationship with your arch enemy, number one, and then number two, whether if you wanted a better relationship, did you think they're more at fault or you? And that just might get people to start sort of, you know, getting what we're talking about here, right? Yeah. And so you lose a lot, you know, and, and uh, people are voting no, Kathy Thorpe, no, absolutely, <laughs> Kathy, that's how I feel too. I don't want to get close to the a-hole I'm thinking about. I want to see him suffer. <laughs> Is that terrible to say? Uh, and, and then Sean Stiller, he, he's saying no. Ruben de Leon says hola. So we say, <laughs> let's say it together on the count of three. Hola. One, two, three. Hola. Hola. <laughs> Uh, and you, Row Kathy, on the side. Kathy says you got to leave, leave your ego, ego at the door. Um, but uh, you want me to read some of these lists that we got? Yeah. So what we're thinking about? What are good reasons? What's the title of your list, David? Well, the, I've got, I got copies from Lisa Kelly. Uh, 
Uh -huh. some list that, that she sent this question out to. Yeah, so it's, I think it's good reasons not to use the five secrets of effective communication, right? Good reasons yeah. not to work on sort of your role in the yeah. relationship, right? And here's Erica, I'll use first names, uh, right. not to embarrass anyone, but Erica from our Tuesday group says, mm -hmm. they don't deserve the kindness, empathy, and respect it conveys. And that's such a common one we can all right. identify with. Or I used it before and it didn't work because I didn't get my way. <laughs> there's, a, there's another good one. Uh, w using the five secrets will not change who they are, and I will just have to keep on using them endlessly. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, you do to have to use yourself. them endlessly. Uh, and she has other good reasons, but let's look at some of Annie's from up in Portland. She does her reasons for resisting are I'm going to look weak. So if I use the five secrets, if I express my feelings, I'll, we I'll look weak. Yeah. Instead of fighting, which is super strong, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we see that politically too. Right. Uh, you know, it's not okay to share my feelings, especially at work or with my boss or with my kids. And a lot of people have this uh, fear of, of sharing your feelings. Yeah. And here's another one. I don't want to hear about someone else's feelings. Oh, so if you have to use the five secrets and empathize and connect, you actually have to listen to how the other person's feeling. Beautiful. It won't work anyway. I'll get vulnerable and then they'll laugh at me. Hmm. Uh, I've tried this three or four times and it didn't work. <laughs> I can't think of anything good to say about that, that person. They'll never listen to me anyway. Those are, those are beautiful. Richard. From, and maybe we can, while you're reading some of them, we can also ask the audience to type in your chat box if you can come up with any unique good reasons not to, like we, we've got lots of tools to show you, lots of skills to share with you that will help you get closer to people that you're in conflict with and help you share your feelings. Maybe you can type in your chat box, what are good reasons not to want to use these tools? Yeah, not to want to share your feelings uh, o openly. Mm -hmm. Reasons not to disarm the other person to see the truth when they're criticizing you or when you're in a conflict with them. R reasons not to, to see the world through their eyes or, or to, to uh, and, and also r reasons not to convey warmth and respect to somebody you're, you're ticked off at. Rob asks R a good question here. He says, if it's it's easy if it's just aggression or disagreement, but what about actual transgressions, right? How do you, how do, you do that then? When someone actually does something that hurts you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, one qu thing about that question, if you want to ask a question about communication and how to, how to resolve a particular conflict with a person, we're kind of looking at all the reasons right now not to use the five secrets. So maybe we won't address that question, but in general, I, I will never answer a general question like that about communication because it's just your bullshit and then my bullshit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, you know, and no one will ever learn anything. So if you want help from us on how to how to handle a conflicted situation, you you have to give us what one thing the other person said to you and exactly what you said next, and then we can make make magic for you. Um, uh, so, um, you want to hear what Richard said? Yeah. He has yeah, yeah. Great yeah. This is a, a brilliant uh, guy at the Feeling Good Institute. Yeah. But again, I won't use last names, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> Richard at the Feeling Good Institute, because there's so yeah. many of them. <laughs> yeah. He says, I love resistance works. Here are just a few of the good reasons not to use the five secrets, and he's listed 35 of them. <laughs> so, I won't read them all, but it protects me from seeing my flaws. Yeah. Uh, the other person doesn't deserve my good communication, protects me from feeling inadequate, you know, if I try to use these techniques and, and fail, uh, and uh, protects me from people uh, criticizing how, how well I do, uh, or it won't feel genuine because it'll I'll sound like a, a formula, and it takes too long to learn. Uh, and... Uh, and a lot of Richards are, you know, about fearing he'll use the five secrets poorly and, and screw up and this will yeah. be embarrassing. And, and Can I and read one that. that's yeah. great here from the audience? Sean oh, yeah. Miller wrote a great one here. So ignorance is bliss. He's saying, I used to feel so certain that I was the victim and blaming other people before I learned the five secrets. Now that I learned the five secrets, basically, now that he realizes that 
it's his responsibility to change. He says, now I feel like a failure often. So kind of like it's more fun to blame other people for the problems in the relationship than to take responsibility and then feel like I'm not doing such a great job, right? Yes, I totally agree. And, right. and, and one of the things about interpersonal therapy that's so difficult, and we saw this on Saturday, we can refer to the fabulous tele, mm -hmm. you know, recorded session that we yeah. did. Jill and I treated someone in London uh, or in England uh, or mm -hmm. Wales who has a marital problem. And one, one of the difficulties with interpersonal therapy, see, when, when, you're, when I'm treating you for depression, you think you're a loser. Uh, every depressed patient thinks I'm no good, I'm hopeless, mm -hmm. I'm a bad human being. And then you find out those are distorted thoughts. You find out you're way better than what you thought. And you feel euphoric and you love us. Uh, now, when I'm treating you for a relationship problem, you already think you're a winner and the other person is a loser. You, you right. think you, you're, you're a victim. And then when you use the powerful techniques we've developed that highlight your role in the problem, it's the death of the ego because you find out you, you're the one who's been causing the very problem you're complaining about all, all along. And it's extremely shocking and, and humiliating and painful to see that. And so when, when we're doing interpersonal therapy, you don't find out you're much better than you thought. You find out you're much worse than you thought. And, and, and it, and it hurts, hurt, hurts a lot. For example, in the session we did on Saturday, Day. Can I just mention what the, the core issue was? Yeah, Jill? I think so. Sure. It, it, it was a, a wonderful guy. Uh, uh, I guess we, we can refer to him by name, right? Yeah. First name, Lee. And um, he, he, he wanted Jill and me to help him with his marriage because he just felt that his wife was criticizing him all the time and trying to control him all the time. And he was sending an emails this because because his wife had a controlling mother and there, she has all these problems. And, you know, what he thought we were going to do was straighten out his, his wife, but we worked with him and he discovered that he causes his wife to criticize him every time he interacts with her, the way he reacts defensively uh, f forces her to, to escalate her criticisms and, and, and to be more, more controlling. And, and tears started flowing when he suddenly saw his role. He said before the live therapy we did, he knew in a vague way that, that, that we'd be, showing him his role in the problem, but he had no idea really that it, that it would be that clear cut. And, 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 but he was a, he was a good guy. I mean, he was, he was willing to endure the pain and I think made some tremendous progress, but right. just, just exactly what you said, Jill. Yeah. Um, and we talked about, we talked a lot yesterday about, um, see, we've been working a lot this Memorial day weekend. Um, we, we talked a lot yesterday about, um, you know, how, how fun it is to debate and how powerful you feel when you argue and yeah. how even, even this may be how some men feel. I, I don't know, not being a man, but like feels like manly to argue and put someone yep. in their place. And yep. um, it feels almost, it could feel sort of emasculating to share I feel statements and to listen to other people's thoughts and feelings. And to be vulnerable and, and to, to admit vulnerable. That, exactly. that you're making mistakes. Yep. Yeah. Sean made the comment that righteous indignation is so satisfying. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah and it's interesting, uh, Kathy, who's our, uh, in, in our audience, is, keeps representing the other side. So Kathy's clearly eager to, to learn the five secrets or already has been. She keeps it. If you relate well with them, you can leave your ego at the door. The barrier breaks down. They feel heard. And you can feel quite empowered at the end. But Which is true, of course. <laughs> that's that, that's really a beautiful thing. And certainly there is a great reward at the end of the yeah. interpersonal therapy to right. enjoy love and intimacy. And, you know, like we went on a hike this morning. It was just a small hike with just three guys. Mm -hmm. We did our seven and a half miles, but we were just so open along the way and supporting each other and uh, just like a, like a beautiful experience. It just doesn't get much better than that. And there's just beautiful rewards of loving relationships. And that's one of the things I've learned from you, Mike, and from you, Jill, is, is your, your humility, your graciousness, your, your compassion leads to such powerful, wonderful interactions. And I've been blessed to, to know both of you, but, um, there's also a huge reward of hostility, right? You, you know, and uh, doing battle. Uh, someone in our country always does battle. Someone who's on the news every day, and 
he loves to 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 put people down and right. to hurt people and, and and to get back at people and to be defensive to yeah. never to never disarm right to never yeah. see truth in anyone's criticisms yeah and there's a yep. kind of cocaine high in that right. a, a euphoria and a, a excitement of power and revenge and those are powerful forces um and people yeah, want and, those things and the other thing i was just going to say i don't you know we're we're this is sort of a hybrid where we're talking to people from the general public and therapists who are using these tools themselves and then also how to bring these tools to your patients and I can say that actually as a therapist, as a person who has now really is very comfortable with the five secrets and sort of loves using them and I prefer intimacy over conflict, it's sometimes hard as a therapist to really align yourself with this idea, like to really allow your patients to sit with your patients and to think, you know, hey, you're asking me for help and getting closer to Joe, but you know, what are good reasons not to do that? You know, what are what are good reasons to keep blaming Joe? What are good reasons to keep arguing with Joe? And what we're talking to our audience about is exactly what we talk to our patients about, right? Yeah. Like we never want to rush in and teach our patients the five secrets, even though we would love to do that and to help them, but we don't do that. We first get them to think about what are all the good reasons not to use the five secrets? What are all the good reasons to keep blaming? Right. Yeah, we we align with the patient's re resistance, and, and uh, a message I give therapists, even therapists in our group, and they never seem to pick up on it or not very well, is don't go out and try to evangelize and teach the five secrets, and then right. they go to their church group or their synagogue, and they try to sell the five secrets to people who start resisting, and Kyle and I have a workshop coming up on the yeah. five secrets uh, in the middle of June, I'll, I'll mention it at the end of the broadcast. Uh, so we're, we'll have to figure out how not to make that that mistake. It's for the local right. ma marriage uh, and family therapy uh, group. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, unless you take resistance into into account into account and get the patient to convince you, a, I really do want to get close to this person. That's mm -hmm. the outcome resistance issue. And b, I, I'm willing to look at my role and stop blaming them, and to experience some pretty strong emotional pain when I suddenly see myself in this in this quite negative light. They're powerful forces against us, and you know, in those situations. On the one hand, do I do I really want to get close to that person? And secondly, do I want to do the work that it's going to take? Because it's it's humbling, it's painful to look at my mistakes, my errors, my the way I'm forcing the other person to actually, you know, interact with me in that negative way. And if, if I don't, even if I kind of look at my responsibility as only two percent to blame, I have to look at my two percent, and I can turn it around with that two percent. But do I really want to? And, yeah. and it is hard work. It's hard work to learn them. They're not easy to learn. They're not natural for us. Oh, that's right. It, it really takes a commitment to learn the five secrets. I, we make them look very simple, but it's, it's kind of like you could watch someone sit down at a piano and start playing and making beautiful music, and you could say, oh, that's simple. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just sit down at the piano and start pushing on those keys, and then it sounds crappy. And, and you have to continue practicing them too. You know, yeah. you could be a concert pianist, but if you don't play the piano for 10 years, you're, you won't be as good with it. You, you still need to practice. You need to continue to grow and our interactions change with different people. And so it's a, yeah. it's a lifelong, it's kind of a cool opportunity because you get to have this lifelong learning and developing deep, deeper connection. Yeah. Right. But it is hard work. Yep. Well, um, should we m move on to another topic or do you want to hear more reasons not to get close to people more reasons not to use the five secrets or what, yeah, what do you we, guys could ask, we could ask our audience i guess they get to decide now should, you know what do you um given all of these fantastic reasons not to learn the five secrets maybe we shouldn't teach them to you you know maybe, maybe you should keep blaming others and um, and we shouldn't, you know, like we shouldn't focus on 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 how to criti you know, how to share criti criticisms in a warm and caring way. And we should spend more time talking about how how much fun it is to blame other people. Or if the audience wants to uh, start to think about, you know, how how to share their feelings with other people openly, then we can move in that direction. Lisa's saying, let's hear some of Ron's we, ideas. We have the, the audience share their thoughts. Ron, yeah, where's Ron? Like he's he's in here somewhere. 
Well, I've got I've got oh, Ron's his list. ideas. You mean yeah, what Ron's he wrote list. in? I've got Ron saying here. Yeah. He's got like thirty-seven or something, doesn't he? Yeah, I've got you them got here too. Lisa Who's wants to read reason, all the reasons not. Wrong. Yeah. Is he the one that starts? It's too damn much work. Yeah, that's Ron. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, I've got uh, I've got your list here, Ron. You've got thirty-seven uh, stellar reasons. Uh, number two, why should I, why should I have to use this if the other person isn't going to play fair? That, that's a good one. Uh, if I do an effective disarm, they'll think they won. Yeah, and oh man, we don't want them to win. Um, four, which we've heard several times, I'll look weak. And five, which is the same as what Richard said, I'm no good at them anyway, or I won't. I'll screw up when I use them. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, you know, here's a good one. Number six. I love your number six, Ron. I'm mad at them, and I wouldn't give them do stroking if they were on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Let them burn at the stake. That's so cool. <laughs> and while it's humorous, we actually do feel that way at times, right? So, just, what do you mean at angry. times? How about frequently. <laughs> frequently. Yes. There you go. Let's just be Ron. I don't care what they're feeling, so why should I use feeling empathy? I don't care what they think. Why should I use the thought empathy? Uh, uh, and uh, I can't listen effectively if I have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> it's genetically impossible for me to be loving and compassionate. Right. <laughs> That's a good one. It's too much work to try to remember what they said. Uh, I don't really want to look at my own behavior. See, that's the biggest point there in the whole world, Ron. That I mean, much less admit that I might be wrong. And there is no truth in what this moron is telling me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I might end up, end up getting close to this person now. That's scary. I'm, we might end up friends. I don't need friends, especially needy ones who want to talk about their feelings. You know, on and on. That's, that, those are beautiful. <laughs> oh, here, they, uh, we got to get Lisa's. Uh, here's Lisa's. Somebody needs to teach that jerk a lesson. I think she's referring to me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe it was me. <laughs> uh, someone needs to stand up to these inconsiderate parents who don't watch their kids in public. She doesn't care if her child wrecks this store, so she should feel ashamed of herself. These are great. Uh, how about Sharon? This is an MD, Dr. Doctor Sharon, we'll call her. Uh, I don't want to work on my relationship with this person. Uh, they're unreasonable, and whatever I try won't work. There's no point. Uh, I'm tired of being a doormat and doing all the work in our relationship. And uh, I've often said uh, enlightenment is a lonely road because, mm -hmm. you know, you are the one who's going to have to to do all, all the work. And if you wait around for the other person to do this for you, it, you'll be waiting forever because it's, it's not going to happen. And I used to have that resistance a lot in the early days when I was developing these techniques and learning them. And I've heard them from tons of patients. Why should I have to do all the work? When's my wife going to do some of this for, <laughs> yeah. for me? So what do we usually say to our patients is, you, you know, you're absolutely right. You, you certainly shouldn't have to do all the work and you don't have to do the work. We also, though, dangle a carrot, right? So we like to let our patients know that, you know, I, I say something like, I'd love to help you to have a closer relationship with your wife and I have some really, you know, wonderful tools. And I think that if we worked hard together, we could really turn things around and you could have the, just the relationship that you wanted, but it would seem, might seem kind of unfair to you because you would have to be the one to do the changing, right? You're here asking for help and she's not. So while I think we could do some great work together at the same time, you know, kind of, you'd have to convince me that you want to do that work. You'd have to convince me that it's worth it to you and that you're willing to put the hard work in, in order for us to do that. Beautifully said, right. Jill. Yeah. A couple quick comments on from Mags and Gabdiola. Uh, 
probably didn't pronounce it right. Hello, everyone. I really enjoy these live broadcasts. Thank you, Sean Stiller. We're talking about the dark side of human nature. A absolutely. And if you don't uh, deal with the dark side of human nature, you're going to be an ineffective therapist when it comes to relationship problems. And 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 also, I would say that I I have a whole bookshelf full of marital therapy textbooks, and I I used to go to the workshops on them right and left. And they were all trying to sell uh, intimacy to, to patients. And, well, we've got these techniques to make your loving, your marriage more loving. And we've got those te techniques. And, you know, they don't work most of the time be because you're not dealing with the dark side of human nature. The, what we've been talking about, the outcome resistance, the motivational factors. Maybe you don't want to get close to that person. And if you do want to get close to them, are you willing to pay the price of, of intimacy, which is the death of your ego and and, and looking at, at your own role, look, looking at discovering how you're you know, nine nine times out of ten, at least you're you're the one who, who who's causing it, who's provoking the problem, and that's so politically unpopular because everyone you're supposed to view everyone as a victim, and and there is of course all this mean spirited stuff go, going on in the world, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Mike or Jill is now going to point us in the right direction. <laughs> Well, Mark, Mark wrote, uh, Jill, that was so neat when you said that maybe you shouldn't teach us the five secrets. I had an instantaneous emotional reaction of, wait, no, I want to learn them. Totally yeah. unbidden, strong emotional reaction. Very cool personal experience of what happens during the paradoxical agenda setting. That's um, neat. So maybe we should, uh, we could shift gears certainly and talk about, um, kind of using, I think it would be using I feel statements when we want to share, you know, criticisms or make requests of other people, this idea of instead of criticizing others to share our feelings with them. Yeah. And then after that, we'll do pornography. Yeah. I think it kind of falls in the same category, I think, yeah. but um, right. this idea of absolutely. Sharing, sharing feelings. Well, that's a, a absolutely awesome point you just made. Uh, so okay. why don't you start us off on, on this, Jill? Well, you know what, David, I was thinking, I, I'm happy to. I also was thinking, you know, that you have this wonderful story that you tell of when you had a patient who came in to see you. And I think he was fairly disheveled and he yeah. smelled really bad and he talked about, yeah. you know, hurting women and things like uh, that. Yeah. And well, how this, get... this seems to me like such a beautiful example of sharing what would feel like such an incredibly hard criticism with someone and you did it yeah. in a caring way. Yeah. Yeah, I had a fellow uh, was referred by his parents uh, for because they thought he was depressed and alone and lonely and and you know drinking constantly and he he was a construction laborer and uh, uh, he, uh, he he was. I had the greatest feelings of dislike for him of any patient I've ever ever worked with, and I, I, I've always had the philosophy that if, if you're upset with a patient, uh, you you have to tell them instantly, immediately, or or it's going to go down the, down the drain. But it was very very difficult for me because he would come to sessions covered with urine. It's it seemed like he just smelled like an outhouse. I don't think he ever bathed hardly. And then I had cloth chairs so that when he left, the, the, the pee smell stayed on the furniture. And so the next patients would think maybe I peed in my pants or something. And it took a whole week for the smell to, to get out of the office. And then he'd come in for another session and stink it up again. And then all he did in sessions was talk about how much fun it would be for him and me to go out and get drunk at night and rape women. And it was just disgusting to me and then he wasn't doing any uh, psychotherapy homework and I was trying to think how am I going to tell him this and because my philosophy I've, I've got to I've got to tell him that's my rule but I have to tell him in a way that will be flattering to him and I was thinking, how in the world am I going to do that and after a couple of sessions, I mean, I just couldn't stand it anymore. So I, I, I said to him, uh, we'll just we'll call him uh, Harold or something. I don't remember what his name was. But I said, Harold, I, I, would it be okay if I tell you a couple of things that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you because I'm afraid I might drive you away or, 
you might drop out of therapy or something, and that's that's the last thing in the world I want I want to do. And but would 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 you mind if I just share a couple things that have been kind of eating away at me? And he said, Yeah, that's okay. And I said, uh, And that's that's one thing you can do, by the way, to, to share criticism with people is kind of warmly and politely, you know, ask, ask them if 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 they'd mind. And and then and then I said, uh, I, I don't know how often you bathe or if you're aware of this, but you have kind of a strong body odor and uh, it stays in the office almost for up to a week after, after you go and, uh, and patients have been complaining about it and it's been kind of bothering me and I want to just, you know, pass that along to you. And then another thing I've noticed is, is, is that you come to sessions and you talk about how much fun it would be for you and me to go out raping women at night and getting drunk and raping women. And I don't know if you've, Ask yourself uh, how I might feel about that, but uh, but tell you the truth, it's really disgusting to me, and it's it it, it seems it upsets me a, an awful lot. And then and then you don't do any psychotherapy homework, and uh, and and I find myself thinking, gosh, I wish this guy would would drop out of therapy. I like I find myself wanting to get rid of you. And then I thought, wow, this is really exciting. What a cool thing uh, that I want to get rid of you. Because this is the very issue you came in for, for therapy for, that you're, you're not close to, to, to people and you don't have, a, have any buddies. And, then I, and here I am, someone you're, you're paying to hang out with, and, and I actually like you a lot, and, and yet I'm, I'm feeling pushed away. And I thought, wow, we, we could talk about that and really develop a better, a better relationship. So I thought, if I, if I told you these things, maybe it would, it, it would bring us closer. And, and that, that's why I decided to take a chance and tell you. And um, he didn't seem seem bothered by it at all. That's just my phone ringing. I hope it doesn't upset anyone. He didn't seem bothered by it at all. He came back the next week. It was all clear, cleaned up. And he had an agenda for things he wanted to work on. And he, he started doing his, his, his psychotherapy homework. And uh, it, it was really the turning point in our, in our work, work together. David, I was noticing a couple of the different five secrets that you used just so masterfully. The one was stroking. We found positive and affirming things to say right from the very beginning. I don't want to push you away from therapy. And then, and then inquiry on a few occasions, and then lots of I feel as well. Yeah. Those, those three, it was just all woven together like that music that sounds sweet when you hear it. Yes, yeah. and the decision I had to make, see, the problem is when we get into conflict with someone, we, we kind of have this angry entitlement and we want to get back at them and lash out at them. And that, that's when, when thing giving into the dark side. And I have a lot of the dark side in, inside of me. By the way, I'm having an obsession right now, which is weird, because when I look, <laughs> look at my face, the inside of my mouth on the video looks all black. I don't know if you can see that. No, <laughs> I'm thinking. Oh my gosh, my mouth is all black. It looks really <laughs> weird to me. But I had to make the decision. So you're yeah. turning over to the dark side, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. My whole face <laughs> will go black. Are... Horns will come out of my forehead. Hollywood uh, lighting. I just, in there. <laughs> I just had to make the decision that that uh, to to say these things in a way that would not rob him of self-esteem, that he would save face and that he would feel that I really liked him. And the other thing was I did kind of like him. And then once he started working, you know, I, I liked him. I liked him uh, tr tremendously, uh, tremendously, but it was, it was just hard for me because I was scared to do it. It's anxiety provoking, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I was also going to share, um, Let's see. I, I was thinking. I recently. I have a couple couple stories where this came up for me. But I was recently working with a couple, um, and a lot of people think, "Oh, women are all about sharing feelings, and men are not." But I was. Yeah, recently nothing could be further from the truth. But there are no women in the United States, aside <laughs> from you, Jill, and one or two others who can deal with emotions, and no men can either. We're all. We're all in the same boat. But I, I, I saw this couple recently and they had this interesting dynamic where the um, husband was, was upset because he felt like his wife was always telling him what to do and, and kind of controlling him and criticizing him. Um, not unlike the couple that we were talking about um, 
David. Um, but actually the, the woman in the relationship was my patient and she brought her husband in just for a couple of sessions. So she was the person that I had, you know, more of the relationship with and, um, and she had an agenda to work and, and to change and to get closer. And he actually, her husband was saying, look, you know, when I, when I don't do what you want me to do, like I don't take out the trash or I don't clean out the kitty litter. Or I, you know, I, whatever, I didn't empty the dishwasher. Like, I don't want you to just come in and scream at me or do it for me even, which is a lot of times that she would just do it and then feel angry and resentful. He said, I really think it would work better if you could just tell me in the moment, like, I feel really disappointed that you didn't empty the dishwasher. Or I feel really like it smells because of the kitty litter and I'm exhausted and I, I feel really burdened right now. You know, can you help me? And so it was a perfect example of, you know, he was basically saying, look, instead of either yelling at me, telling me what to do, or just doing it and then sulking about it, just in that moment, can you tell me how you feel? And she was really wonderful and honest about how she felt worried that if she would be vulnerable and tell him how she would feel, then he wouldn't do it anyway. And then she would just feel even worse. You know, and he was like, well, give me a try, you know, give me a try. Just let me fail. Tell me how you feel and see how I do. And he also was like, and now that I know that these things are so upsetting to, of course, I'm going to try hard to do them. So, no. you know, it just it, it, and, and it worked beautifully. You know, she just had to really work on sharing her feelings instead of either yelling or doing, you know. That is really beautiful. Now we're going to bring out Jill's true genius and Mike's true genius and uh, address the question that someone put to us and we will keep it. We won't use any names or anything, but it's, it's, it's can I describe the problem you think, Jill? And then you'll. Sure, yeah. And we may, we all kind of read it very quickly. It was a long email, right? And we may even get it wrong, but, but it's worth it. <laughs> we'll tell you what we thought of it, right? Yeah. And, and, there may be other components of it is what I mean. There may be other yeah. pieces to address. Yeah. But it, it's essentially a yeah. young woman. Uh, someone said, how could I help a young woman who's concerned that her uh, every boyfriend she gets into is into pornography? And then she uh, tells them she, she doesn't like that, makes them promise not to be in pornography. And then she discovers they're going to strip clubs and and then she cross-examines them and, and gets all disappointed. And she's thinking, uh, how, how can a, you know, the pornography is getting so widespread. Maybe it's hope. She feels hopeless that she can ever find someone, someone to love who has her, her value system. No, oh, my little kitty just came in and rubbed up against me. <laughs> Nothing yeah. distracts David quite like a, a sweet kitty. <laughs> yeah. Misty. Come here, Misty. Misty, come on. I wish she'd come over so I could hold her up. I, I just love her so much. And and uh, Jill and Mike came up with some fabulous uh, solutions to what sounded to me like an incredibly difficult uh, problem. And they will now reveal the answer. Well, this is certainly a, a problem we're seeing more and more all the time. It's a different era, a different age. And, and so there isn't, you know, a lot of kind of, you know, experience necessarily with this in you know, the way our parents grew up and those sorts of things, not a lot of modeling. And so how, how do you manage these situations? And, and I think we asked the question, how does this fit with our topic today, right? And how do you, you know, approach somebody when there's this concern? And, and it would be much like we just demonstrated right there. The I feel statements would be so, so important in, in including the, you know, the affirmation, the inquiry, connecting and, and, um, and now let's just let's just spell this out because people heard yeah. what you said, but they didn't grasp what you said. Um, but when you say she could convey her feelings with I feel statements versus controlling statements or, or demanding statements, comment on that, Jill. Right. Well, I think one might be tempted to say if this were your belief, you know, pornography is disgusting and you're betraying me and you're not being faithful and, you know, all of these kind of criticisms and arguments, which would obviously make your partner or boyfriend feel, you know, guilty and, and uncomfortable. And, um, and, and then maybe he has to even, promise to, to do better <laughs> and, and then he has to lie. 
Right, right, right. And then if this were something that he actually wanted to do or was into, would have to somehow, you know, cover it up or lie about it, right? Or like, in other words, the idea is that by making a demand of someone, you almost push them to, you know, do it, but do it in a sneaky way. Um, and um, the alternative would be to to openly and vulnerably share feelings. And one could certainly use all of the five secrets, I, you know, you could even say, look, I, I can imagine that pornography, you know, could be exciting and going to strip clubs, you know, um, could be exciting. Um, and, and I get that that's something that you've, you know, been into or been interested in or something that's fun for you, you know, at the same time, you know, I feel kind of hurt and um, unattractive and unimportant and um, I'm trying to think of what might be other feelings. Maybe betrayed. Um, betrayed, yeah. When when I hear that you're you know doing these things, and I care so much about you, I really love you, I really want to be close to you, and um, and so that's I, I want to sort of share these feelings with you. And can you tell me kind of what are your feelings about this? You know, can we can we kind of talk openly about what 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 your thoughts and feelings are. So then you'd be creating an opportunity for in, instant in, in intimacy with this individual rather right. than some kind of power exactly. struggle where you take the role of the, of the nun and he takes the role of the bad boy. And right. then this, this game get, gets played. Another thing that we were saying that, that might, might be helpful. I was, I was talking about a patient I once had who was into some very, kinky kinds of sexual fantasies and I, I didn't, didn't have a lot of expertise uh, so I sent him to a colleague who specialized in, uh, in you know sexual issues mm -hmm. and the colleague just advised him to you know find groups uh, of people with similar sexual interests uh, and, and to right. find a partner he could, you know, engage in, in these kinds of things with. And that had never occurred to him. And he did that. And it worked out really well for him. And so I was thinking in terms of this question that someone posted to us, if, if you're allowed to find kinky colleagues to hang out with and mm -hmm. pe people with your same sexual preferences and bondage or humiliation or wh whatever, you know, cross-dressing, whatever your thing, thing is, uh, that maybe aren't we also permitted to find people who have the same value system that, that we have? I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who who would prefer a, a more of a, a purer kind of relationship. Right. And, uh, the, the, you know, that, that to think that there are no men involved in the world, left in the world, who have, you know, your value system, I, I don't think that would be... Right. But the, the idea is that you 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 do a much better screening job actually if you yeah. said to the person kind of here's how I'm feeling and how do you feel about this kind of what yeah. does this mean to you how important is this to you like what function does it serve for you you know like to really be open and loving and wanting to understand will actually allow that person to be open with you and maybe then this is someone who doesn't want to give up pornography and and maybe they're not for you for that reason right. But if you tell them that you don't want them to use pornography, then, you know, it just sort of pulls for the like, OK, I won't. And then I'll go use it and not tell you. I yeah, just love what. Go ahead. On the flip side, they may this gentleman may be somebody who actually has a similar moral kind of uh -huh. value, but is really struggling with it. And then when that dynamic happens, kind of feels like, oh, I need to just get that bit of release or whatever. And, right. and or I got to act out. Entertainment. Or, yeah, that, yeah. The, the, the dark side. Right. What we're talking about a little bit is is the philosophy that we bring to human relationships, and I, I just, Jill, I just thought what you were modeling and showing right now was just fantastic, just spectacular, and it's the idea that, that the uh, I think it was a Jew, Jewish theologian, you would know this, uh, Mike, uh, trying to think his, of his name, but it's the I thou versus the I it relation, Martin Buber. Buber. Yeah, yeah, and what what we're talking about is that. You know, the stroking part of my model, which is such a crappy word, 
for it. But <laughs> Especially I, when we're talking about pornography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but I, I've just never come up with a better one. But what it means is, is in any conflict with someone, that's one of the five secrets of effective communication is to con convey warmth, compassion, respect, to show an interest in how the other person is, is feeling. And it's just the opposite of what most people do most of the time. Uh, you know, the dark forces prevail and we get into what he called I it relationships where you think the other person is an object to be manipulated, to be defeated in a competition uh, that, that, or exploited, that there's some battle going on. And, and, and then when you model, Jill, the I thou relationship, it just, I don't know, to me, it's just jaw-dropping. And, and in the past, I've talked about how I, I know of two women who were uh, captured by serial killers, serial rapists, and used the five secrets of effective communication, and they were, they were saved uh, be, because they, they, they didn't buy into the they, – they treated the person with, with respect, which you think is the last thing you'd want to do to a serial killer, but it's the first thing you want to do because it blows their, their game. Okay. And uh, I, I won't go into the details of it right now. I've probably talked about it previously anyway, or I can do it on the next podcast if people like. But it it, it, it was jaw-dropping. Jaw One of the guy, men even um, turned himself into the, into the police be, because she had been so warm after he kidnapped her. He didn't touch her or hurt her in any way. Um, but she did just exactly what you modeled, Jill. Yeah, I was going to say, I have one other super quick, sweet story, and I know then you might want to, to work on wrapping us up soon, David, but yep. um, so I, this is something that we not only practice with our patients and teach our patients, but we practice it with our loved ones, and I recently had the sense that maybe I had taught my two boys well. I have a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old, and um, actually, it was maybe a year or so ago, my, he was probably eight or nine, and my son, I was hurrying him, I was rushing him, I was giving him a quick bath, and probably the whole time, like, come on, Andrew, come on, we gotta go, we gotta go, some obnoxious parenting move, because I just wanted to be done for the night, and, and my son just looked up at me, and he said, Mom, I feel so pressured, <laughs> <laughs> and I just stopped dead. And was like, I was like done. I just couldn't, I was like slowed down a hundred percent and, you know, just was like super present with him because all he said was, I feel so pressured. Now, if he had been like, mom, why are you rushing me? Why are you in such a rush? I would have defended myself, right? I probably would have been like, well, because I'm tired and I want to get you to bed. But like, all he did was this sweet little I feel statement. Yeah. And I couldn't have felt closer to him, and I had no desire to to put him to bed. I just wanted to hang out with him, you know. That is so neat. That's yeah. beautiful. That so neat, so magical. Well, there is magic in this. By the way, Kathy Thorpe, I think, said, "Could we bring in uh, Fabrice on one of these podcasts?" Because she loves his questions, so yeah. you know. But we could we could do that because we can have yeah. up to, up to four. And if he wants to join us, I'll pass that on to him. Yeah, I have a few uh, interviewer. Some yeah. announcements? A few uh, commercial announcements. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing two workshops in Canada, and Mike is going to be with me, and we're also going to do a live demo at each one, and it's Scared Stiff, my two-day anxiety workshop. It's, it's a, I'd say it's a pretty darn good workshop. It's been one of the best-received workshops I've ever created, and it's going to be in Calgary on June 4 and 5, and then Winnipeg on, on June 6 and 7. Uh, and you can get the contact information for that and all of my workshops if you just go to my website, feelinggood.com forward slash workshops. You can go there now and see how to register if you're interested. Then also I've got an intimacy training one day workshop in Mountain View, California, sponsored by the local uh, Marriage and Family Therapy Association on June 15th, and Kyle Jones from our Tuesday training seminar, he's a third year PhD student at Palo Alto University, a uh, really cool guy. He, he's going to be with there, be there with me with some of the small group exercises. And this is going to be an intimacy training workshop for therapists to teach you what we're talking about today, how to use the five secrets of effective communication with your challenging patients, clients, and also with your challenging, difficult uh, loved ones. Uh, 
and it'll be a very experiential day. There'll have, you have to have a few PowerPoint slides to orient people, but it'll be mainly practice, 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 and, and, and feedback. David, are you on next week for Facebook Live, or are you traveling that day? Because I know I will not be here because I'm on my way to Calgary to yeah, meet with you. Th thank you. No, we'll, we won't do Facebook Live this coming Sunday because, uh, you know, you and I will be on our way to, to Canada. You'll be in Canada already. Uh, and, but we will reconvene uh, in two weeks from, from today. And it, will you be with us, Jill? Yes, I believe so. Should we do a part intimacy part three? I would certainly be open to that. Yeah, what do you let's think, see. Mike? We'll we'll have to put our heads together and see what Figure more. Out. Yeah, what else? Yeah. We'll we'll send and, out a blurb about it. And David, and did you mention maybe I didn't hear you, but that people could go to feelinggood.com, right, to find out more information. Yeah, about my your workshop. workshop page. You go to yeah. feelinggood.com forward slash workshops, and yeah. then you'll you'll see if you want to get more information about these workshops or or, or, or yeah. link it into them. Uh, and and then, Kath, go ahead. What one thing is um, somebody asked a question about how we do five secrets with dating and that's coming up as well because you're going to do a Facebook live with um, Angela and Kyle, I believe, uh, right. in June here. Right, David? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And that m might be on that date. I'm not looking at the calendar now, but yes, yeah. I, we're, we're also going to look at the other half of intimacy, which is the dating scene. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's yeah, a kind of a dating game that you have to learn to play a little a, a little bit which is different from this uh, the intimacy training we're talking talking about here uh, jonathan asked will there ever be any workshops in southern california uh, or are they always in northern california uh, there will be uh, i i think i'm going to be doing two sponsored by the institute for the advancement of human behavior iahb and they'll both be in Los Angeles, my trauma workshop in the fall. And so once the details are, are worked out, I'll post it again on my workshop page on my website. Um, and um, yeah, and people are asking, yeah, of course, you can always email questions to David or myself or Mike, and we will try to bring them up in the in the live broadcasts and address your questions. Yes, and if you yeah. have a question about an intimacy problem, remember, what did the other person say and what did you say next? Yeah, specific, the, yeah, specific as possible, right? Yeah, all this good stuff flows from there. And if you have a general question, we probably won't be able to, to answer it because it's just on the bullshit level. I, I don't mean to be insulting, but that's, that's the facts. But if you give me an actual moment of an interaction, that's like a fractal, fractal. And, and that's the, 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 the whole key conflict that, that you have. And we can do fantastic work uh, telling you, showing you why that's not working for you and, and how, to, how to respond more effectively. Yeah. Um, thank you for all the kind comments. Tell us what you like and what you don't like because we're, we're wanting you to shape this. Uh, yeah. So it, it's what you want. Kathy, thank you. Kathy Yerk Leffler, so appreciative of you. I wish there was a doctor like Dr. David Burns in Milwaukee or Dr. Jill Levitt or Mike Christensen. Yes, thank you for those kind words. And um, yeah, and Lisa has the website here, www.feelinggood, one word with two G's in the middle, dot com. I think I'm a con man. And C O N M. It's so out. So, oh, and Ellen, hi, Ellen Sand. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I love what Ellen wrote. She said, I thought that I had to let go of all my grudges to get close to my sister, but now I'm feeling like this could be a, pos a fabulous opportunity, like to actually share your feelings with your yeah. sister rather than just having to hold it all in, right? Yeah. And yeah. TJ Lucian says, yes, uh, Jonathan Avalo, I love Fabrice too. Fabrice is getting a strong following, which totally. makes him insecure and jealous, but he is really <laughs> awesome. Handsome, brilliant, kindly. He's got that beautiful French accent. Uh, yeah, we'll get, we'll get, we'll, we'll see if we can suck him into one of these. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Have a good thanks, one. Everyone. Have, Have a great week. Memorial Day weekend. Bye-bye.